Bishop of Northfield. My name is Susie Weinbeck, and my husband Wyman and I have been members for about five years. UUFN is an inclusive community that nurtures spiritual and intellectual growth and fosters ethical and social responsibility. If you are a visitor, either outside, on site or online, we are glad you are with us, and we invite you to stay after the service to get acquainted. We welcome your questions and look forward to getting to know you. Each week we join together in a practice of building a better world in community. Later in the service, we will collect an offering and we'll split it with an outside organization to help us remember that we can't make the world a better place on our own. This month's Share the Plate recipient is Side with Love, the Unitarian Universalist Association's public advocacy campaign. Side with Love advocates for change, such as immigration reform, racial justice, equality for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people, religious freedom, and more, as they work to make love real in the world. During our offert offertory time later in the service, you are invited to give online from our website, uunorthfield.org, or as the plates pass. Thank you in advance for your generosity. I call your attention to the order of service, of the announcements listed there and in the weekly email. There you'll find more information about the following. The International Day of Peace event, which will be held at Northfield's Central Park on September 21st. UUFN's Religious Education Teacher Training, which will be on September 23rd at 1 p.m. on Zoom. And again, more information in your bulletin. Join us next Sunday for a wider welcome. Reverend Sarah and worship associate Brenda McCoy will reflect on this month's theme, the gift of welcome. What does it mean to consider welcoming as a spiritual practice? Welcoming change, welcoming diversity, welcoming each other and our own truest selves. And one final note, I've been asked to tell you to feel free to grab some of the surplus irises and daylilies outside near the Peace uh, Garden and Arbor. These were left over from the perennial planting the garden team worked on this past week, and I will say in some not so pleasant weather part of the time. Some bags are provided for your use. And speaking of the garden team, if you are a member of that team, would you please stand? We really would like to thank you for the, the beauty of our grounds and all the hard work that you do. Again, welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Northfield.
Thank you, Larry McDonough and Richard Terrell for that beautiful piece. I will be sharing a little more about their backgrounds um, a little later in the service. Our opening words today are by Aaron Stockwell. As we gather, as we begin a new church year, let us be amazed. Let us search for new life and hope in our midst. Let us nurture creativity in every form. Let us be reminded that new insights of the universe are always being made. As we gather, as we begin a new church year, let us be amazed. Come, let us worship together. The flaming chalice is the symbol of the Unitarian Universalism. Each Sunday when we gather, we bring this symbol to life together. Please join me in speaking the words for the lighting of the chalice. Let us open our eyes to see what is beautiful. Let us open our minds to learn what is true. Let us open our hearts to love one another. Good morning, everyone. I am the Reverend Sarah Smalley. I serve this congregation as its minister. And today, I have a time for all ages story for us that is about the history and the future of Unitarian Universalism. It's one of my favorites. This is a lamp in every corner. Many years ago, in the land of Transylvania, in a mountain valley watered by quick rushing streams and shadowed by great forests of beech trees, there was a village of small wooden houses with dark shingled roofs. The people in the village were of the Unitarian religion. This is true. And they wanted a church of their own, a church set on a hillside, they decided, looking down upon a village as a mother gazes down upon her sweet sleeping children. So all the people of the village labored long and hard to build themselves a church. The stonemasons hammered, the glazers made tiny glass panels and fitted them neatly into windows. The foresters sawed tall beech trees into enormous beams and laid the trusses for the ceiling, then covered the roof with close fitting wooden shingles that wouldn't leak a drop of rain. The carpenters carved wood for the pair of wide opening doors. A bell was brought from a faraway city, then hoisted by roops with a heave and a hoe to the top of the tower. The weavers wove fine cloths for the altar table, cloths embroidered with flowers and edged with lace. The smiths hammered black iron into tall lamp stands and hammered thin bras into shining oil lamps. Finally, when the building of the church was done, the painting of the church could begin. The painters mixed bright colors, royal red and shimmering gold and brilliant blue, and everyone in the village, young and old, adults and children, came to decorate their church. They painted flowers, they painted trees, they painted designs around the windows and different designs around the wide opening doors. At the end of the day, when it was finished, when their church was finally done, all of the people of the village stood back to admire it, and then to sing a song, a song of happiness and praise their village 
had a church now, a church set on a hillside, looking down upon the village as a mother gazes down upon her sleeping children. We will eat now, announced an elder of the village because everyone was hungry after their long day's work. And later tonight, we will gather again to pray together. So the people of the village went down their hillside to their homes and their suppers, and all except one little girl named Zora and her father who stayed behind. They had brought their own bread and cheese and they ate their food slowly, sitting on the grass on the hillside and admiring their new church with its strong stone walls, its tall tower and its magnificent bell. After they had eaten, they went back inside, opening those carved wooden doors to go into the gloriously painted sanctuary inside. Oh, look, Father Zora cried, running from picture to picture with her foots echoing off the stone walls. See how grand this is? Yes, it is, her father said, looking around and nodding with pride. Yes, it is. But father, she said suddenly, we have not finished. What do you mean? There are tall iron lampstands all along the walls, but there are no lamps. The church will be dark when the people try to come back and find their way. Ah, no, little one, said her father. The light of the church comes from its people. You shall see. He rang the bell to call the people to worship, then took his daughter by the hand and let her back outside. They waited on the grassy hillside next to their beautiful church of strong gray stone. The sun had set behind the mountains and night was coming soon. Yet in the growing darkness, tiny points of light came up from many directions and moved steadily up the hillside. Each family is entrusted with a lamp, little one, her father explained. Each family lights its own way here. Where's our family lamp? Your mother is carrying it. She will be here soon. The many lights moved closer and closer, gathering into one moving stream, all headed the same way, growing larger and brighter all the time. Zora's mother arrived, bearing a burning oil lamp in her hands. The father lifted Zora so she could set their family's lamp high in its tall iron stand. All around the church, other families were doing the same. Soon the church was ablaze with light in every corner, for all the people of the village had gathered to pray and to sing. All through the worship service, Zora watched the lights flicker and glow. She watched her family's lamp most of all. When the service was over, her father lifted her high. She took the shining bronze lamp from the lampstand. Its curved sides were warm and smooth in her hands. Her mother carried the lamp home with the flame lighting the way. The lamp flame lit their house when they returned home. Zora washed her face and got ready for bed by the light of that flame. Mother, Zora began as she climbed into bed and lay down. Yes, little one, her mother said, tucking the red wool blanket around Zora's shoulders. Father said the light of the church comes from its people. Yes, but also the people take their light from the church. Over on the table by the fireplace, the shiny bronze lamp was still burning. And, and we have that light every day. Yes, indeed, said her mother. And even when we are not in church, even when that lamp is not lit, we carry the light of truth in our minds and the flame of love in our hearts to show us the right way to be. That light, the light from truth and love will never go out. 
Never, asked Zora. Never, said her mother. And this bronze lamp will last for many, many years. When you are growing, we will give the bronze lamp to you. And when your children are growing, you will give the lamp to them. And all of you will carry it back and forth to church every time. But there is only one lamp, said Zora. So make another and let the light grow. And someday, tell your children to make more lamps too. And now, good night, her mother said, and kissed Zora once on the cheek and once on the other cheek and once on the forehead. And Zora closed her eyes and drifted into dreams while her mother gazed down upon her sleeping child. The years passed. Zora grew. The bronze lamp came into her care. She kept it polished and clean. And when the bell rang out across the valley to call the people to worship, she carried the lamp back and forth to the church on the hillside, the flame always lighting her way. When the time came, she made more lamps and gave them to her children who made more lamps and gave them to their children. And so it went on through the years, even until today. And always the light of truth and the flame of love from that Unitarian church on the hillside in Transylvania continued to grow and show them and us the way. Now, I don't have a brass lantern, but I do have my camping lantern. <laughs> <laughs> I do have this lantern that I will light now in the sanctuary and bring it down to our children's religious education program today that the light of this gathered community will light our children's space as well, and then their light will light the world and go on through the generations. In a moment, as I carry this uh, lantern flame, lantern LED flame downstairs, Taylor will lead the congregation in Singing As You Go, which is written by UU minister Suzelle Lynch, and it is a song written specifically to sing children out of the sanctuary and to their RE classes. This Sunday, we will learn the song. There are actually already kids downstairs, so I will bring the light to them today. <laughs> This Sunday, we'll learn the song, and then generally the third Sunday of each month, it won't always be that, but generally the third Sunday of each month will be a sharing Sunday where the children will start in the sanctuary through this time for all ages, and then go downstairs for the remainder of the time. In that way, we begin to worship together as a full gathered community, and children know that the sanctuary is also for them. And so today we will practice singing it. Taylor will lead it. We'll sing it twice through uh, as I go downstairs and gather with our children and with Ashley and Nita. Taylor. As you go, may choice around you. As you go, go in peace. No As you go, may joy surround you. As you go, go in peace. Know our love is with you always. As you go, as you go. Thank you. I invite you to allow yourself an unhurried breath. Relax your shoulders, inhale, and exhale and let your heart catch up with you in this moment. Rest in the embrace of a wider love. In the presence of this love that holds us all, 
we use our chalice flame to light our candles of community. We will light our first candle as a blessing for the wider world. We know too that the details of our daily lives are sacred and important. We now light a candle for all the simple joys that are sustaining us. And we light another candle in honor of the sorrows and hardships we might be carrying. Sorrows we carry in our hearts, but that have not been spoken aloud. And we move into a time of silence. May the truth of your heart be reflected in these flames. Amen and blessed be. We will now gratefully give and receive our offering for our Share the Plate recipient, Side with Love, which seeks to harness love's power to stop oppression. Thank you for giving as generously as you are able, one way we make our care for the world tangible. Thank you. At this time, I am happy to introduce to you our guest presenters today, Richard Terrell and Larry McDonough. Richard Terrell's new book of essays is Essentially from Holy Cow Press. He is the author of six previous books, including the memoir Fake Book, Improvisations on a Journey Back to Jazz, and Coming Late to Rachmaninoff, winner of the Minnesota Book Award for Poetry. Larry McDonough is a St. Paul jazz pianist, singer, and composer. He has performed at jazz festivals, 
concert halls, jazz clubs, and churches around the country, and has arranged for and performed with legendary saxophonist and composer Benny Golson. He has released 10 CDs and DVDs as a leader. His new CD is Kind of Bill on the Palace Grounds, marking 40 years since the death of Bill Evans, playing on radio stations and streaming services around the country. For over 15 years, Richard and Larry have been performing at UU congregations throughout Minnesota and Western Wisconsin. Welcome Richard and Larry. Thank you. Um, our presentation today is called How It Got Made, Trusting the Creative Process. And we're gonna talk about how our creative processes um, result in what we're going to present today and, and hopefully connect with you about your own creative processes. The piece we played for Prelude, A Rose for Two, um, was part of a project in which um, my daughter with special needs and other kids with special needs wrote some melodies on computers and then my job was to turn them into pieces and just to give you a little snippet of what Rosie wrote it was and it was kind of like whoops took me a while to come up with what we did and that was a really fun process and how she wrote and how others wrote um, actually pushed me to kind of re-examine how I write and kind of changed how I write the next piece we're going to do is a piece that I wrote for my Aunt Mary Lou. She was the other professional pianist in the family. And when her time was near, she asked if I would play at her funeral. And I thought I would just play something classical. because She was more a classical player than me. Even though I'm classically trained, I kind of went to the dark side. And um, but this tango kind of popped into my head on the way back from Iowa. And I actually pulled over and wrote it down because I was a little worried I was going to forget it. And then I got home and played it, and it's a tango on nine, which is sort of like kind of weird. And um, it is how it was. So this is uh, called Tango para Maria Luisa. Thank you. 
One source for creativity, at least in music and writing, is, of course, sound. Your program says, if it sounds good, it is good. <laughs> Makes sense, doesn't it? Um, and even in writing, especially in poetry, sound carries, at least in my opinion, 51% of the meaning. If it sounds good, it is good. When you're writing, you don't think about the meaning. You think about what it sounds like. Um, so everything we do today will be about sound. A second source, I think, for poetry and for really for, I would guess, all the arts is you go to the uh, art museum and you see those students with easels sitting in front of a Rembrandt or an Edward Hopper and they're copying stroke for stroke the master. And we do the same thing. And, and in a few minutes, Larry will, I, I assume, describe how the jazz pianist Bill Evans copied from Cole Porter to make something new of his own. Uh, so I'm going to read a poem of mine from this book called What Falls Away Is Always Poems and Conversations. And um, this is a poem in which I've stolen from William Butler Yeats' poem, 
the Lake Isle of Inish Free, which is a lovely poem. And I kind of Wisconsinized it and put it into vernacular uh, American English. So, so Yeats's first line, I'll just give you a little teaser so you can get my receive my meaning. Yeats begins and says, I will arise and go now and go to Inish Free. It's lovely. And so I said, I'm getting up soon and going to the lake. <laughs> you know, because that's the way we would have said it. And there's nothing wrong with American English. Uh, and he says, and a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. And I say, going to the lake where my father's cabin leans toward the north. Uh, and he says, nine bean rows will I have there in a hive for the honey bee and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I say, more chinks between the logs than last year's newsprint could patch. It was a crummy cabin. Uh, and then he says, Yates says, and I shall have some peace there for peace comes dropping slow. And then I made a peaceful image of my own. I'll catch black bass after dark in the lily pads. It's dark, you're fishing, <sighs> right? And then I, because I'm not as good as Yeats, I kind of got away from what he said. And his poem is 12 lines long, mine is about 19. You know, I uh, couldn't do it. But he ends uh, by saying, this is so lovely. He repeats his first line, I will arise and go now. For always night and day, I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway or in the pavement's gray, I hear it in the deep heart's core. And, uh, and I do that too. I say, okay, I'm getting up now because for days I've heard the frogs awakening. And I'll read the rest when I read the whole poem, which is now, the lake after Yates. I'm getting up soon and going to the lake where my father's cabin leans toward the north, more chinks between the logs than last year's newsprint could patch, old kitchen pots on the front room floor to catch the roof's leaks. I'll catch black bass after dark in the lily pads. And each day my father will talk about hunting birds this fall. And my mother will read a book and occasionally remember dreaming. It's a place of such anticipation as when morning lifts its dew over the grass in August and over blueberries too small in the wetlands, never grown sweet. And the bittern standing on one leg and the loon sane as day. The mosquito buzz at evening sends us indoors, mostly safely. Everyone knows that joke and the holes in the rusted screens. Okay, I'm getting up now, because for days I've heard the frogs awakening and the blackbirds find syllables and the few cars on the road hidden behind the young red pines. I'm down that road, away, always away now, and looking toward its farthest bend. It's okay to clap for readings. <laughs> My day job is I'm a legal aid attorney and I've, I've checked your ordinances here, it's okay to clap. <laughs> So um, next piece we're gonna do is all of you. It's, it's a piece uh, not to be confused with all of me, uh, which is a different piece. All of you is written by Cole Porter and uh, we performed it on, on our new album of, of Bill Evans music. And so what Bill did, uh, it's an interesting process. Jazzers often change the pieces that are given to them to personalize them and to make them kind of freshly improvised. And so I want to play you just a little bit of the original All of You uh, by Cole Porter. So the first thing he did is he reharmonized it. And so that's something that um, jazzers often do to kind of make the tune sound just a little different. You change the harmonic structure. So he put it in a different key and he reharmonized it a little bit. I, I'm kind of guessing this was his process because this isn't the final product.
But apparently that wasn't enough. And so he starts changing the melody to the point that I think he could have just renamed it his own tune. I'm going to play that now. And you'll see that it sounds similar, but it's really a new tune. But he was a deferential guy. And I think he said, since the source material is core Porter, I'm going to still call it all of you. So this is his rearrangement of it. Another source for art is maybe the most obvious one, and Larry described that with the tango, it's personal experience, is writing from what happens to you, what you observe, and so on. Um, I'm going to read a short essay. It takes about four minutes, so we're doing fine. It's called Solstice, and it's from this book, Essentially, a book of essays. It's my most recent book. Um, and of course, all of this really happened. It's an essay. It's not fiction. I left some things out because most of life is irrelevant. You can shape events without and still tell the truth. But I haven't, I haven't changed anything. And again, when I wrote this, I wasn't concerned about what it meant. Um, I was concerned about how it sounded. And I assume because it, it meant something to me, so it probably would mean something to other people. 
solstice. Life used to be fun, my mother says after, before her 89th birthday. Now it's shit. <laughs> it's hard to argue with her. Her memory is such that she asks me questions and by the time I answer, she's forgotten what she's asked. Our conversations take on an Abbott and Costello circularity. Suddenly disagreeable, she starts every sentence with but. She no longer remembers my father, 20 years gone, and calls me by my brother's name. You just have to get out of bed and start your routine, I tell her. It's a lame proposition, I know. Why, she asks. Her contradictions out of character for the person she used to be are now the most rational feature of her discourse. I just want to be somewhere where I can help someone, she says. She will never help anyone again, not even herself. I'm trying to be a person, she says. I walk her down to the lunchroom of the nursing home and sit with her next to her roommate, what's her name? Six months older than my mother, roommate Mabel. Mabel has a broken knee that now will never heal and a mind as cloudless as a mid-June day. When we got the farm, I cleared 60 acres of rocks, Mabel tells me. 60 acres, but I loved it. This, Mabel adds, it's a hell of a life, but as long as I have my wits about me, I'll get by. I know that Mabel is referring to my mom, and I'm thinking Mabel needs someone to point to who's worse off than she is. Maybe we all need that. After lunch, I leave the nursing home and drive for the woods. I've forgotten my fishing gear back in the city, but on Audi Lake, I paddle my kayak on a day that's a poster for Wisconsin in early summer. Wild irises are in bloom wherever sun hits the shoreline. Water lilies, the lake with many bays and inlets I can explore. There are no cottages, there is no development to mar the shore. There are only two skiffs fishing, some kids laughter from a campsite out of view a mother bald eagle tending her nest on a dead tree, wary of my little boat. Otherwise, only me. I drink two cans of beer in the sun and get delightfully toasted. I'm happy to forget who I am one week before solstice, that midpoint. It will be the longest day, but the hottest weather comes in July. I load my kayak atop my car for the drive home. There in the sand of the parking lot is a painted turtle, just more than the size of my hand. She doesn't move, though I could touch her with my paddle, could kill her, except I love turtles, love all creatures of the lake and its shore. What is she doing here, seeing me, yet not moving away? Is she lazy like me? Avoiding something, enjoying something else? No, she's laying eggs. On this one day when something in the water or the air or in herself tells her it's time. She makes a kicking motion to cover the hole she's dug, then ambles off. Her shell, pieces of a puzzle, black lined by orange, flash of orange from her underside, a yellow line along each cheek, her legs, ancient skin, sinuous. She can smell the lake and knows which way to go. She's crawling through a parking lot. So I step behind her to quicken her pace. I follow her all the way back to the water, which she crawls into the way someone tired might crawl into bed. She is beautiful to me. There is no way those eggs will ever hatch, ever bring forth life. Heading out of the woods and on my way home too, six more times I stop my car, hurry turtles out of the sand in the middle of the gravel road before they're run over by some driver who doesn't care. Um, the next piece we're gonna do uh, also off our our new album is Blue and Green. It's often attributed to Miles Davis, like I have a piece of music here, it says Miles Davis, it's incorrect. Uh, Miles took credit for it, which is common for band leaders back in that era to take credit for pieces that were written for them. Um, 
the the story is that Miles gave Blue Evan gave, gave Bill Evans two chords. Do something with it. And so Bill did something with it, and it's blue and green. And uh, and we're not doing this other piece today, but it it became the inspiration for a piece that I later wrote called Tuscarora, based on my favorite lake in the Boundary Waters. Uh, this is blue and green. It's best if you close your eyes. Yes, we are. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you want to talk about it? We're going to read the Ellie scene, right? I, I think so. I thought there was going to be uh, an introduction okay, before not. that. Oh. No? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, I believe in your program is um, the music for Ellie's name. And this is another piece where uh, kid Ellie, um, special needs, uh, was writing a melody on a computer. And uh, this is all she gave me. She gave me four notes. And it was like, okay. Um, so I struggled with this one for a long time until I realized if I took those four notes and made it a phrase of five notes, I could fool everybody into thinking there was more to it than it is. So it goes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two. Okay. The nice thing about this is that if you think you can't sing, you can sing this. I mean, there are only four notes. I mean, you can do this. And it doesn't have a big range. It just goes from, so you're good. So uh, what we're going to do is I'll, I'll play it one time, and then we'll sing the first verse, and then Dick and I will improvise over it, and then I'll bring you back in to sing the last verse. Okay, you good? All right. Yeah, you can play it, yeah. Go ahead.
Thank you so much for being with us today. Our closing words, uh, our closing benediction is by Susan L. Van Dresser. Let us sing the magic of imagination by which we know one another and learn the lives of eras gone by. Let us sing the magic of creation by which we build the world of our soul and teach us or teach its wisdom to others young and old. Let us sing the magic of our lives together, holding and shaping by the movement of breath from heart to lung, all new life that is to come. Go now with singing. Go now with magic in your fingertips. Touch this world with life. And now we will extinguish the chalice. We join together in the words for extinguishing our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Please rise in body or spirit, and with your hands over your heart, or holding a hand of those next to you, or whatever posture is most comfortable for you, we sing words of blessing one to another. May the long time sun shine upon you, all love surround you, and the pure, pure light that's within you, guide your way home. May the long in peace.